It's 4 o'clock on a Monday, and you know what that means. It's time for another exciting episode of Taxi TV Live. Yeah, baby. This week, starring very special guest star, Mr. Ralph Murphy. Yay! Thank you, fake band. Thank you, fake audience. And welcome, real guest Ralph Murphy. <laughs> Darn good to see you. Darn good to see you. Um, sorry, we're running a little late today. Ralph and I get together once a year for <laughs> two days of golf. Today was one of those days, and things were just moving slowly on the golf course. Uh, it was mainly us moving slowly because we spent so much time looking for lost balls. <laughs> yeah. It was very windy, a very long course, but we're here, so thank you for your patience and thank you for tuning in. Um, all right, so let me give you a little background on Ralph, uh, if I may borrow this. First and foremost, he is the author of this amazingly good book, Murphy's Laws of Songwriting, the book. Um, <laughs> you know why I came up, came up with the book? Because I couldn't think of anything else. <laughs> I was, I was, then what are you going to call it? Well, I said, um, the book. <laughs> Exhibit A. Right there. And during his five-decade-long career, Ralph has been a hit songwriter, a performer, record producer, music publisher, lecturer, author, vice president of international and domestic membership at ASCAP. He's also the author of the powerfully insightful book, Murphy's Laws of Songwriting, the book, which is chock full of practical songwriting tips and examples that will help you become a better songwriter before you finish reading it. That's a promise. Uh, colleges and universities the world over use the book as a leading textbook. He's an in-demand lecturer at music conferences in the United States, Canada, Australia, Scandinavia, and Europe. But it won't cost you a dime to learn from this songwriting ninja because we've got him here in yes. the chair today. So, yes. welcome, Ralph. Hello. Welcome to the folks in the chat room. Great to see you. Um... Ralph is a great motivator. Thanks for everything. Ah, Well, yeah. thank you, thank you. Well, you know, I, I, I really study, I descend into hell every Christmas, and I study all the number one records, uh, pop, country, country airplay. And I would say there were, this year, there were 38 airplay, country airplay records. There were 11 uh, top 10, or some number one uh, country uh, billboard chart records. And there were nine number one pop records. Well, I would say out of all of them, I probably like maybe three or four. But 20 million people loved them and adored them and bought them. So who's, who's right, those 20 million people or me the chump? Um, I've, got to, I've got to respect the consumer. Uh, so I really need to know what the consumer wants. So uh, that's the, the, the major reason that I study all these number one records, just so I can get a handle on it, what they, consumers, want from me. Well, there you go. Um, consumer, customer's always right, no doubt about it. Yes. Um, sad, but true. Well, no, I don't think it's sad. I, I think that people should get what they want, um, get what they bargain for. That's the nature of business and commerce and, and art. Look, nobody buys a painting for their home that they don't love. Exactly. You know? Well, the same way that they either love or hate a song, uh, you don't really love love a song. and You don't really hate a song. That means it spoke to you about you or a situation you heavily identified with, or it didn't. It's it's that simple. That's why you what motivates you to love or hate a song. Works for me. How about? Uh, it seems like we've moved into a period where beats are very very important in pop records in particular. Um, sometimes uh, you came up and I was fairly close behind you in an era where lyric craft was critical, mm -hmm. especially in Nashville. Nashville and. You go to a meeting with a publisher and they will take a song apart. Not to be malicious about it, but they'll say, well, you know, the pronoun should be this. And you spent too much time getting to uh, the hook and the intro is too long. And they do it because they're trying to help the writers become better. But nowadays, beats are very, very important. And I noticed, uh, I have noticed in many of the songs I hear on the radio, the lyrics are inane. 
but the beets are infectious. So mm -hmm. um, does that play into what you're going to talk about today? Oh, yeah. No, um, if, you, if you notice, in, in most cases, uh, number one records are under 100 beats per minute simply because they're, you're, you're dealing with a sedentary audience. Uh, if you look at Wrecking Ball, it was 60 beats per minute, which is at rest music. Uh, hello. Tell uh, them what at rest means. At rest means 60 beats per minute is when you're, you're at rest. Uh, you are driving in your car, you are sitting in an office, you are doing whatever you're doing, but you are not dancing. Uh, the, the great bulk, almost 95% of country records are under 100 beats per minute, simply because you're not dancing to them. You may be drinking to them, you may be, <laughs> you, but you're driving a car to them or, or you're responding in a, in a positive way. So um, just basically, uh, I can read you. Um, should we, do you want to listen to some songs first? You want to do two songs now and two songs later in the show? And, and we sure can. Okay, uh, let's see the reason I'm really excited about uh, uh, having done the research on all these songs, it's like, ooh, 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 you won't guess what's happening out there in the marketplace. Well, then let's do this stuff and we can listen to some songs later okay. in the show. All right. Okay, don't sure. you guys in the chat room let me forget to play the songs. We got them ready to go. Oh, okay. All right, so, yes. Um, okay. Take, take it away. You, you know, want the pop charts or the country charts, billboard charts, or the country airplay songs? Uh, what's your favorite? I have no favorites. I, I will start with the country airplay songs because okay. there were 38 of them. Right. 38 number one records last year. Uh, and I will achieve. So if you want a hit that will go to number one on the country airplay chart, have an average of an 18 second intro because it will be designed for radio. Uh, intros are designed for radio. Make sure that the artist is speaking speaking directly to a quote-unquote you within 15 seconds on average so after a, the vocal kicks in. A literal you. Like, you, uh, you, you are the subject of the song. You, you is make the me trigger feel like word this. Okay. that invites the listener in. Uh, make sure the, the problem is it's called playing the you card. When you play the you card, you have to tell that listener how great they are. You can't go on about yourself. You have to... Tell them how wonderful they are. Um, make sure that the artist is speaking directly to a you within 15 seconds. Write the song in third or second structure, but don't be afraid of fourth form. That's verse, chorus, verse, chorus, uh, instrumental, chorus, and out, or verse, chorus, verse, chorus, middle eight, chorus, and out, or bridge, as it's called. Um, don't bore us, get us to the chorus. Is the is the uh, anthem yes. is is still the anthem for a country airplay? Um, hit the bridge or middle eight or instrumental between two minutes and change. It's called the two minute wall. Uh, keep it under a hundred beats per minute. Eighty six. All of them seem to be working at eighty six beats per minute. Dead end the song. And that is important to dead end the song because you don't want you don't want uh, that listener. Uh, weaned off that particular song and moved on to the next one, you want them annoyed and want to hear it again. They feel cheated. So it's really important. And um, probably aim it at a male artist or not. What does okay. that mean? Probably. Well, you mean if you're a songwriter, write for a male um, artist? There was, there was only one female artist on the uh, Billboard 38 uh, 38 of the 38 number one records there was why? only one female why do you think that is because who were the listeners I would have I would think that the listeners would Are be have more women than men more women than men and well, women actually, um, I'm, I'm doing a project with um, uh, an Australian university um, males uh, apparently stream um, w women physically download and buy hmm and that's that. Uh, that's my October project, and that's that's really fun because uh, I really want to know, and the only way for me to find out is to do it. So, so women obviously want to hear mm -hmm. a male artist. 
Is, oh, is yeah. The bottom line. Not only that, the, the last thing a woman wants to hear at 7 in the morning as she was on her way to work is another woman whining. Okay. So um, the, uh, once you get under 100 beats per minute, um, the, the, the thing is with pop, uh, all the, the, the women are winners. If you're looking at Lady Gaga, you're looking at Beyonce, you're looking at uh, um, um, all of them. They are all winners. Empower female empowerment. With, with female empowerment. So okay. that gives them a role model. Just at the, the, the beginning of the day, they are rocking. They are invested in that. So it's, it's, it's really, really cool. Um, Russell Landwehr in the chat room is saying that when you talked about the dead ending, uh, mm -hmm. or dead ending a song. Um, in film and TV parlance, we call that a buttoned ending. Um, mm -hmm. Same thing. You're just talking about sure. a finite ending usually goes back to the root chord yes. and just ends on a beat yeah. and rings out versus a fade, right? Yeah. Anything uh, more to it? Yeah. What, no, what we would do um, when, I was do, when I was producing a lot of albums, and uh, very successful albums, we would always like put 10 or 12 or 15 songs, and we would always do a fade which would wean that listener off that track and move them on to the next track. When you're designing singles, and again, they, these are singles that someone is going to spend between half a million dollars and two million dollars on. Marketing. A marketing. Um, that's in, in terms of video production, tour support, all that stuff. Uh, on average, it's going to cost about a million dollars for a country single. Um, the, the minimum is probably about a half a million dollars in, in terms of what is, what's going to resonate with people. Anyway, sorry. The pop. Not sorry at all. Oh, no, no. I, it's just, they're actually the IFPI. The, Which stands for? The International Federation of Phonographic Industry. Damn, I was reading that wrong. I was having a dyslexic moment. I was <laughs> seeing it from a distance. I thought it said pornographic industry. I thought we were going to cover some new ground today. No, <laughs> record companies are estimated to annually invest uh, $4.3 billion worldwide in artists and repertoire. That represents 27% of industry revenues. The major labels combined have around 7,500 artists on their rosters and tens of thousands more are assigned to independents. Say that again. Okay. The major labels have around 7,500 artists on their rosters and tens of thousands more are assigned to independent labels. All right. So that's 7,500 artists and you've got to figure mm -hmm. that some, probably two-thirds of those artists use outside songs. Yes. yes. So call that whatever that is 5,000 artists that need songs every year yes and what you are doing you are designing scripts that will make people want to spend up to a million dollars on them so you are doing a script that will basically make that singer look good to people who are predisposed to hate them um, make that singer look like a winner Use the pronoun you to invoke, invite that listener in within about 18 to 20 seconds. Uh, change the rhyme scheme verse to chorus, verse to chorus, or verse to pre-chorus to chorus to lure the listener through. Although I, I have noticed um, in, in, as hip-hop is creeping into, um, into country music with like Sam Hunt, uh, his pre-choruses, he changed the, the, the rhythm in, instead of changing the actual rhyme scheme, which is a, a fascinating new development, which I, I think is going to be fun. It really is. Everything is fun. To uh, and, and we get a surprising <clears throat> number. I mean, not a huge number, but surprising for how relatively new it is. Hmm. Um, people in film and TV looking for hip hop stuff. Oh, yeah. uh, and, and not even necessarily with lyrics, but it, it yeah. has and clear. I think you and I have probably talked about this on a golf course before that it's come of age because the listeners have come of age. Kids yes. that have grown up, um, kids that live in country radio markets have grown up with hip hop and they wanted to hear the two melded together. And as yes. soon as they heard it, they went, I love that. Yes. And if you're looking at Josh Osborne and uh, you're looking at Sam Hunt, you're looking at um, Chris Stefano, you're looking at um, um, Mac McAnally, or actually uh, Shane McAnally. Um, they're, they're 
really, really taking on board the genre, but expressing themselves with, with country roots. It's really, really cool. So how does that affect, if I can take it off your game here for a minute. Uh, no, sure. Uh, I'm trying to imagine a publishing meeting in Nashville where somebody goes in, a songwriter goes in to meet with a publisher, and what they've got is a hiccup song. Mm -hmm. um, have the publishers, you know, glommed on to that, and do they understand the structure of hiccup, and are they able to guide their writers as well as they were with traditional country coaching? I don't think they, they, they're they really uh, writing herd over. Um, it's basically, if you get a writer signs because they're writing with the right posse. Um, that posse means that basically uh, they're writing with Dallas Davidson and Ben Hazlip and or they're writing, they're part of the, the joint venture. Uh, a lot of writers have joint ventures. Uh, Brett James has... Um, Ashley Gorley has uh, a, a lot of uh, um, uh, singer-songwriters, uh, actually, sorry, songwriters take on uh, new ventures with established labels and set up their own company and virtually groom them, um, which is, is great because groom, I think it's... You lost me, groom. <laughs> groom the new writer. Who's, the, who's grooming the new writer? The when, when you say the Gretchen, established the established writers. Yeah. Uh, if you look at the Craig Wiseman's, you're looking at uh, Ashley Gorley's. You're looking at Brett James. You're looking at whatever. They are doing joint ventures with established publishers, and then they're and they're grooming and developing the younger hot, writers. Got yeah. It. Okay. Which I, I, I personally I think is wonderful. That's the way I learned uh, as as you know as a, a child writer, as a kid writer. It was lovely, and it was really, really, uh, as much as I, I resented that information, when they said, oh, no, no, you, know, you have to, your pronoun should be you, not uh, she or he or it. I was, what do you mean? You know, I'm, I'm 20. You're, you're over 30. Gosh, <laughs> what do on. you know? Yeah. What do you know? And I really found the craft was, uh, all the changes from uh, year to year and genre to genre is vocabulary and technology. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's really, really lovely. The way that the, the human animal receives information is a constant. And that's, that's lovely. I, I love it. All right, continue, please. Okay. Well, let's, let's do the pop. Okay. Whee! All right. So, if you want a, a, a number one pop a billboard chart record, remember, these were the number ones of last year. This is the consumer speaking, not me. Uh, have an approximately nine-second intro. That's factoring in Taylor Swift's zero start and dividing by the number of uh, total number of songs on the chart. Explain what a zero start is. A zero start is when it starts from, from zero. So there is no intro. Just there is no intro at all. But again, she's she's dealing. Uh, Taylor Swift is dealing at eighty-five beats per minute, which really is kind of a, a radio-friendly uh, tempo. Um, anyway, uh, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> nine number ones are aimed at radio, whether streaming or not, dancing or not. Use the pronoun you within twenty-one seconds or sooner. Use detail to invite the listener in. Tell them how good or bad that quote-unquote you is. Get to the first use of title in under one minute, uh, in one minute or less, and have a dead end. If you're aiming at under 100 beats per minute, all of them were between 80 and 86 BPM. And that gender issue, well, that's a whole different, a whole different thing. Well, what do you mean? Uh... Unlike the country genre, pop deals more equitably with female artists. Three of the nine number ones are written in part or, and or performed by women artists. Hmm. Unfortunately, when it comes to the writer part, those are the only two females who wrote on number one songs in a total of 33 writers. Wow. Why is that, do you think? Do you know why? I, and I challenge, and women really, really do this well. Um, there is a whole uh, cathartic thing. Well, you hurt me, blah, 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 blah. Get over it. You, that singer, is artist, is always a winner. 
if it's like uh, Carrie Underwood, hey, good girl, you know, she's not, it's not her. She is talking to uh, uh, this other girl. So all you have to do is change the pronoun and you look like a winner. Why would I spend um, $1,100,000 making my artist look like a loser to women at worst time of day possible, first thing in the morning? I will not do that. That song is a script to make that singer look good to women at seven o'clock in the morning. It's slightly different when, when you're going into streaming and you're going into uh, dance and you're going into, there's a whole a, a bunch of uh, different genres that are engaged, but in country, it's, uh, it's very, very, very specific. Interesting. Um, somebody had a question, McGaeth asked the question, if telling the you they are bad, will they switch their allegiance to the singer? So I think she means that, you know, if if I'm singing through the radio to you going, you're such a bad, bad boy, Ralph. You're such a bad person, awful, well, terrible person. If if it's the woman telling this guy that she he's bad, yeah. then that's fine. Because it's empowering to the women. Yes. Okay. But if it's the other way around, not so much. Yeah, it's probably a lawsuit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there you go. A PC lawsuit. Uh, it, it's really interesting. The whole gender aspect of this is interesting. Um, how, how the different genders absorb music and consume it. And, and I mean, do, do pro writers actually sit down? Look, you, Ralph knows virtually everybody who's anybody, if not entirely everybody who's anybody in Nashville. And, and hit songwriters all, all over the world. Do they sit down when they sit to craft a song? Do they consider this stuff? Or do they just emote and it comes out sounding like a hit? But will, will they rework a song and go, you know what? This song doesn't speak to you. The pronoun is wrong. Or this mm. song doesn't empower the female singer that I'm pitching it to enough. Do they think about this stuff? Or is this stuff that happens and you've um, annotated it or noticed it after the fact? Well, I, it, it just seems to be a recurring fact. Uh, and everything. And uh, let me go back a couple of years ago. I was doing this uh, for Robert Horsfall at the, uh, at the, uh, the, the, in, in near Baker Street. It is really, really a, a great little warren of uh, studios and it has top liners and producers and uh, this is in the UK. writers in the United Kingdom. Well, I was doing a, a presentation basically on the PowerPoint uh, saying, you know, this happens and the pronoun you, and just so happens that back in Nashville, uh, the pronoun that wanted was the number one song, uh, Hunter Hayes, and the first word was you. And in England at, at the time, the number one song was uh, uh, I, Hall, Hall of Fame. Uh, um, and it was, you can do this, you can do that, you can be in the Hall of Fame. So uh, I, I said, I used that, that uh, current example of yeah. that information. And uh, afterwards, uh, this gentleman came up to me and said, oh, by the way, um, I'm, I'm the uh, writer, well, I'm one, one of the writers on uh, Hall of Fame. And he said, I've got a great story to tell you. And I said, oh, okay, what's the story? He said, well, my name's Jim Bo Barry. And I said, okay. He said, when we wrote the song initially, it was good. I can do that. I can do that. I can be in the Hall of Fame. And then we, for about two days, we argued back and forth whether it should be you or whether it should be I. And I guess we, we decided it should be you. I guess we did right. I mm -hmm. said, you are, that, that is the script really, really did it well. Is that, that because is, nobody cares when it's all about, I did this, yeah. and I care about that, and I was hurt yeah. by this other thing? Nobody yeah. gives a damn about me. The first three, when the voice coming out of the radio is yeah. talking to you. The first, the, three, the first three things you feel you have a mandate to do when you discover you have this wonderful gift of creation is whine, preach, and vent. You know, the last three things I want to hear coming out of my speaker is someone whining preaching or venting unless they do it with humor, irony, and detail, detail, detail. Invite me into the song. Writer's assumption will kill you. 
Well, so what, you, what she is, explain what writer's assumption Okay, writer's is. assumption. You assume, every writer assumes that everyone knows what they know. Right. Well, she left him. Who's she? Who's he? Where'd she go? What happened? And you leave that listener to, 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 twisting in the wind. And it's awful. You can't do that. You want to hunt someone down and say, write the first verse. Invite me in. Basically, the first four lines um, of every song lead directly to that title line in 60 seconds or less. And the title line should be in the hook. Yeah, the, 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 the title, if you, um, there was only one song of the 38 uh, Airplay records, um, the 11 number one country records, uh, and the nine number one pop records. There was only one record, one record of one song that didn't feature the, the song. And there was the second number one, and it was The Weeknd. And Hills. Mm -hmm. Hills was not a destination in that song, but uh, that was their second number one. Um, so, whatever. It's funny, we were talking about this today in the golf anomalies. course. Anomalies. I love anomalies, by the way. When something doesn't fit the pattern, it's a, but it's still a big hit, you go, oh, okay. Well, and patterns, the whole idea of being formulaic scares the crap out of writers. Sure. I, I know that from, you know, close to 25 years of running taxi, people are so averse to, oh, you know, I don't want to do something formulaic. Mm -hmm. um, and that's because they're creative people, right? You guys want to create something new and different and have the world go, wow, that's new and different. And congratulations for creating that. So we were also golfing today with um, Marlon Hookman, Hookman um, Bonds who's a hit songwriter in his own right and, uh, and a much better golfer than he thinks he is, I might add. Yes, he is. Uh, and, and a really good guy. And we were talking about this, I think, on the first hole today about writers having this aversion to being formulaic. And he made a comment that that doesn't scare me because I want to write music that people want to consume. You know, I, I'm, I want to do this for a living, so I need to give the audience what they want. So if you can tell me better what the audience wants, I want to deliver that. I think that that was a good, healthy attitude because he didn't even consider that that would engender a lack of creativity on his part. It's just like, yeah. tell me what the structure is, and then I'll get creative within the structure. I've got to know... And every year I, I study all the number one records. And as I say, uh, I, I probably hate 90% of them. And these were number one records that sold millions and millions of records. And uh, you go, man, wow. And then you listen to it over and over and you see in a pattern evolving. And you, you suddenly have empathy with that song. You, you see, see what the listener wanted and got from it mm. and it, it just you, it charms you as as grudging as grumpy as i am it charms me <laughs> uh we hear this from as i say in the book <laughs> well, look, a lot of our members are you know like 30 to 60 year olds uh, middle-aged people and, and they don't like what they hear on radio today and they don't want to be formulaic and they're really resistant um to writing for today's artists and today's radio hits. But I, I also make the argument all the time, I'm hearing more interesting stuff on the radio in the last two or three years than I heard in the decade that preceded it. Oh, yeah. um, some new artists and, and labels are taking more chances. They're hungrier to find artists, even though much of what you hear on the radio sounds like formulaic pop. There are artists that have broken through that aren't formulaic and they become the new thing to emulate. So mm -hmm. I don't, I, I think it's a really good time right now, personally. Yes. And always remember that that script that the, as you, as a songwriter, you writing the script to make that singer look good to people who really, who didn't tune in for new music. They tuned in for something that they loved and they, they already had a good association with. So it's, it's overcoming that resistance in 60 seconds because that's all you have. There is no waiting for the second verse. 
if that doesn't have it and doesn't invite me in to that song within 60 seconds, I'm gone. Do you think it's because we're so used to, I mean, if I have a question, if I'm doing fixing plumbing at home and I need an answer, I can go to YouTube and find a video that's a two minute video on mm -hmm. how to, you know, get a diamond ring out of the J pipe or whatever they call yeah. it in your drain. Um, everything is instantaneous now and we live in a society where information flies at your face all day long. Are listeners impatient to get to the chorus because of that or? I think they always were. They want to be spoken to about themselves or a situation they heavily identify with. I think it's all about them. That's why they, they say, well, I love that song or I hate that song. They do neither. Sorry, I'm scanning the, the chat room to see if anybody okay. had a question. Uh, do you try to write six months ahead of the trends? That's from Richard Charles. No, I, unfortunately, I just follow the title. Uh, I'll find a title that really charms me, and I'll carry about 250 titles on my phone. And I'll go into a sit writing situation, and I'll throw out, how, how about, uh, that's why I love you, and they'll go, no, I don't think about that. Well, how about uh, Tennessee Avenue? Uh, how about that? I'm seeing the Monopoly game in front of me. How about the electric company? No, no, I don't want to write that. And I'll go through like half a dozen songs. And at some point in time, someone will go, the b &O Railroad. Wow, and he, you could tell a story about, you know, I lived by the b &O Railroad and blah, blah, blah. You know, he, when he was a kid, and then he grew up to be whatever, and suddenly a song is is evolving from from scratch. So uh, it, it's it's title driven, really, for me, and but that's just me. Um, I I have written two tracks. Uh, I've done a lot of stuff in in Europe uh, where I'm writing two tracks. But even then, I need to find a destination something, a title that really charms me, that invites the listener in. And generally what I'll do is I'll, I'll develop the chorus and then say, okay, what's the most original way I can set up that chorus? And then I will take those four lines that just lead me straight into the song. But that, that title better re reside within uh, 60 seconds of, of the actual song. Um, speaking of songs, would you like to listen to one and give some feedback? I would love to. All right. Bring it up. Uh, whoops. Okay. You guys up for a little music? Okay, this song is called Shine. It's a singer-songwriter song, and I believe in this pile right there you have a lyric sheet. Oh. Ah. Cool. Penny for your heart, dollar for your gorgeous mind. I need you to know that you make me feel alive. You had to risk it all, gamble everything. It's in the way you look at life Taking in each day How you make the most of it Even through the gray You shine Breaking down the walls, seeing all the way inside. Let you all the way in, cause everything just feels right. It's 
in the way you look at life Taking in each day How you make the most of it Even through the gray You shine You shine. You shine. You shine. You shine. All right. Your thoughts, please. Okay. Um, first of all, hits, Robbie. Uh, hits aren't written; they're rewritten. Um, that's just the way it is. Um, 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 Alan, Alan Shamblin was telling me about uh, that uh, he, when he wrote with Mike Reed. Uh, um, he, 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 it was originally the song um, was originally written as an up-tempo bluegrass song. Which song? Pardon. The, um, um, the Bonnie Raitt song? Yeah. Did they write that? Um, I Can't Make You Love Me. Yeah. It was one, originally... It one was, of the ten greatest songs of all yeah, time. Yeah, but it was originally written as an up-tempo bluegrass song. But it just wasn't working. So he went round to uh, Mike Reed's house, and it, he told me this story. And uh, he said, it's just, it's, it needs to slow down. So I went, ding, ding. He said, no, no, slow it way down. I can't make you love me and it, it just really resonated it, it he, he is the master of okay penny for your heart dollar for your uh, gorgeous mind i'd risk it all i'd gamble everything that's that's really great but it's not leading me to you shine uh, a star for your heart uh, a rainbow for your gorgeous mind i need to need need i need you to know that you make me feel alive for you i'd risk it all i'd Throw the, st the stardust away. Uh, how do you make the most of it? Even through the gray, you shine. Uh, Ollie, <laughs> that's, that's really interesting. Um, basically, I would, I would, all that, all that stuff really has to lead to shine. And the other thing, on the second. Uh, second time you do it, breaking all the walls, seeing all the way inside, letting you all the way in because everything just feels right. What you're going to do is uh, you you don't use the uh, lift or climb. For you, I'd risk it all. I'd gamble everything. You go straight into it's in the way you look at life, taking it each day, how you make the most of it, even through the gray. You shine. I think I, I would do even more shine uh, images. And just, they're such a, a wonderful vehicle. And it's really, really good. I, I just, I, I would have a good time with that. But I would lead, have everything lead to shot. But even through the gray, you shine. And I'm not sure the penny, the dollar, or the, the gamble, everything, um, makes, leads me to that shine. Anyway, but... That's, uh, it's, it's really good, and you're going to, first of all, it's a, a great first step. Excellent. Excellent. Um, you want to mute that sucker? Yeah, sure. By the way, that was Todd calling. <laughs> oh, good. Um, cool. Good job, Robbie. Uh, yeah, normally we don't mention the writer's names. Robbie had already outed himself in the chat room. Uh, <laughs> but excellent. Really, really well put together. All right, let's do one more, and then we'll do a couple more later. Uh, this one's called I Got My Girls. Standing here crying 
Cause it's Friday night The moon is just right There's lipstick on my glass I'm in my purse And while you're out there Stringing me along I got my girls Give me your right now, not in a minute, baby. Give me some certainty. I'm done with tomorrow and maybe. Give me your country heart. Give me your truth. I don't need your attitude or rhythms and blues. Cause it's Friday night. The moon is just right There's lipstick on my glass I'm in my purse And while you're out there Stringing me along I got my girls It used to be chivalrous and you pick up in boots You used to toss pebbles I'm not on my roof But now it's Friday night And the moon is just right This lipstick on my glass I'm in my purse And while you're out there Stringing me along Very cool. Is this written by a guy? It is, um, I believe. Okay. This is classic writer's assumption. If, if two girls go out and have lunch, and one sits down and says, well, he left me. The other one goes, is he working out? Has he lost weight? Has he got a new car? Has he moved yet? They want to know everything that goes with, he left me. Two guys go and have lunch, and one sits down and says, wow, you know, she left me. The other one goes, man, that's a drag. Have a beer. <laughs> End of conversation. Okay? Well, I've got my girls. I wanted to hear about the girls. I, I was lost. I've got to say, there are... What, you're, you're leading me to, I've got my girls? What happens with the girls? And who are the girls? And... and, and I don't, I'm trying to find a delicate way to say this, but some women will refer to a part of their feminine anatomy as the girls. And because it leads up to it with, I uh, got the lipstick on, got the pearls, I got my girls, for a split second I went to that image and went, well, no, it can't be about that. But there is no further explanation of who the I, girls are or why well, they're important. It goes into the guy and blah, blah, blah. Now, see, if this was a girl singing it and you wanted to, to have a script, she's got her girls. She's going to be fine. For bad boys like you, she ain't standing in line. She's got, you've got your football, you've got the guys. It's all about you. Well, but she's not standing here crying. 
She's not standing here crying because it's Friday night and the moon's just right. There's lipstick on her glass. She's in birth. While you're out there thinking you're stringing her along, she's, she's got, got her, her girls. Room. And then the party starts. I want to know. They've got the, the jug of wine in the pickup truck and they're driving through town picking up guys. And I want to I wanna party. Come on. It's a vehicle for that... that uh, um, <laughs> empowerment. Empowerment. Yeah, I wrote that down in the first 20 seconds of the song. I wrote down empowerment question mark because it had a ton of potential to be a female empowerment song. Yeah. But it came off. It, 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 it just kind of. You went. You 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 think you was, were thinking like a man. Get over that, Daniel. <laughs> Jeez, come <laughs> on. It's taken me years to stop thinking like a a guy. <laughs> You've got you. It's really, really important. Anyway, but it, it's going to be uh, again. Just it's got, it's got all the, the the outline. It's got a, a pre-chorus, which is uh, uh, what what is happening in, in structurally right now. It's coming up. Bad boys come and go, just like the moon. But cowboys always know just what to do. That really is good because it's a woman singing to this guy and saying, "Hey." How to build that perfect tire in her heart because romance ain't a pastime it's an art and then you're going to go back it after in the second verse you've got to give me some what the girls are rocking on anyway Whee! <laughs> no, this one's got a lot of potential it um, has a lot of potential um excuse me i like the melody as well yes yeah. Excellent. All right. The singing, uh, uh, it's uh, a really uh, good female vocal. Um, you want to go back now and do some uh, some of that other stuff? Do you want to take questions from the audience, or do you want to listen to more let's, songs? Uh, let's take some questions. Okay. So fire off some questions, you guys, because Ralph wants to take some. Um Oh, okay. Uh, somebody mentioned I saw um, where would you use this song in TV? Um, well, it, in my personal opinion, it's probably a little too much detail. Um, although there are parts of it that would certainly work. You know, the whole aspect of I've got it done the way Ralph just explained it, it would be easier to pitch it for a TV show for a scene about exactly what the song's talking about, which is a woman who doesn't need no guy because she's got her girls. Mm. Those scenes happen. Um, could be too on the nose for that, but uh, it's got potential. All right, uh, let's see. Question. No more I, me songs. So... The, they just that person wants to know so that's it I shouldn't write any I me stuff just always stick to you well f first of all if, if you're cathartic the, the reason we all become songwriters is because we want to tell the world about us the world doesn't care about you sad but true they don't care about me they don't care about anyone except themselves as that writer that creator of that work sees them Every song you fell in love with as you were growing up was about you. They, they, they read your mail. They tapped your phone. They, they were, checked your emails. They knew all about you, and they gave you you as they saw you. That is your job as a creative human being, giving the listener them as you see them. And it, it requires a, a very accurate target. Uh, uh, to, to basically knowing and caring a lot about that that uh, consumer uh, and what they're going through. It's really, really important. Um, how do you avoid writing cliches? And do you talk about that in the book? Um, no, what I talked about in the book is when you finished a song, a way to see, make sure that it is engaging that listener full on and properly. Um, that that is is the the best part. Writing cliches, it's really that the titles are never cliches. If you look at the titles, basically of all the number one songs, uh, they're pretty cliche. 
um, I love you, uh, or cheerleader is, uh, you know, is really, really different. That's, that's really cool. But even then, <laughs> he, he uses the, the cheerleader. Uh, my old, uh, need her, uh, that rhymes with cheerleader, need her. Uh, but he uses the in the in the bridge when he gets to the middle eight, the, the midsection, he uses the pronoun you. So uh, it, he he makes it known that he is speaking about a specific human being. Uh, somebody asks if story songs are still marketable in country. It depends on the story. Um, that really is 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 the is the, uh, the house that built me is really a story song. Um, you you remain linear. Basically, uh, rap is is a story uh, vehicle. Uh, it is a story song. They're they're telling about uh, the experiences on the street or encounters with uh, with you know women or their posse or whatever. But they are, are basically, whenever you remain linear, you, you are telling a story. Uh, the old adage used to be that you don't change your chord till you change your thought. And that is still the same, same uh, thing that we, we cling to all the time. Wherever you're telling a story, you remain linear. Um, I published a song, uh, I Believe in You, for uh, Don Williams. I don't believe in motor cars, organic food, and foreign cars. I don't believe the price of gold, the rising cross of going old. It was stayed on the one chord forever. But he was, he was giving a laundry list of uh, all the, the, the minutia and detail that, he, that everyone needs to know. But when he got to the title, which was about I believe in love, I believe in babies, I believe in mom and dad, I believe in you, that was a totally different animal. Uh, that re required melody because it, it was, I believe in love, come on. That's really corny, but the minutia that set it up was original. It was totally original. Um, first thing you look for in a chorus was a question that flew by a minute or so ago. Well, uh, what I would look for is um, the, the resolution of the idea, but I would look at the chorus and then I would look at how it's set up, how that, that first four lines, how would it lure me into the, to that particular chorus. Um, also, if, if you're, if you look at, like, uh, um, the Justin Bieber song, uh, What Do You Mean?, which starts with the, uh, with the chorus. What do you mean? It's it literally the you and the mean. It, it is it immediate, and it's also 125 beats per minute, so it is geared for the dance audience. Um, but you will find a lot of uh, dance records start with the chorus, or start with a half the chorus. And Lure the, lure, lure the listener in. Um, You're looking very intent. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to get questions because they're flying by quickly. Right. Um, what's the typical or average BPM for country radio these days? 86, <laughs> between 80 and 86 BPM. Um, and this is kind of a bastardization of somebody's question because I mm -hmm. wasn't exactly sure what they meant, but I think I get it, which is more and more structures are being... Uh, broken today. Mm -hmm. There are more anomalies out there. Um, how do you feel about that? Why is it happening? Um, that sort of stuff. Okay, well if you look at the uh, structure for hello, the uh, uh, and it is, it is probably one of the most performed songs of last year. It was a, a huge record. Adele just sang the brains out of it. But it was a, a structure that basically hadn't been on, on the charts, uh, on the pop charts, for like 25 years. It's the AABA -A structure. And there is a, a, a sense of time passage in that structure uh, that you, uh, I learned that years and years ago. The, the first verse is in the beginning verse, uh, ending of the, in the title or beginning with the title. Um, the, once you, you choose a beginning or an ending, you have to maintain the integrity of that rhyme scheme. 
The second verse is the here and now verse. The bridge is but what if, or information not included in the body of song. Then the third verse is the on down the, the line verse. There has to be a sense of time passage in that structure. Well, what she did, is she added a two-line uh, pre-chorus um, uh, right before the, 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 what I, I would call the bridge, which, uh, of course, you would call the chorus. It, it occurs twice each time before that, that uh, bridge or pre-chorus or, or the chorus. Um, and it's, a, it's a, a strange little structure, but it really works. And it's fun, but only only because you know fifth form and you know fourth form can you do that. You can't break rules until you know the rules. Uh, if you're going to be a great jazz guitar player, you have to practice all the, the, the scales and, and the, the, the tunings and all the, the things that required that as a basic music education. Then, when you learn all that, you are free to be different. You can't be free to be different until you know everything the same. Um, yeah. Question, is the uh, verse, chorus, verse, chorus, bridge, chorus, form dead? What, the verse, chorus? Yeah, verse, the chorus? A, B, A, B, C, A, B um, song structure, is that dead? A, B, no, no, gosh, no. Uh, matter of fact, the uh, record of the year in country, it is, it is living in country. A, B, A, B, C, B. Are you talking about the instrumental or the... Uh, bridge version. Uh, oh, bridge. Oh, no, no, no. Verse, chorus, verse, chorus, bridge, chorus. Uh, uh, oh, oh, actually, uh, A, B, A, B, C, A, B would be verse, chorus, verse, chorus, Bridge, verse, chorus. Again. There, no, there is no uh, verse after right. the expectation uh, of the uh, the listener is that after the uh, middle eight or bridge, you are done with all the story. That may be an instrumental, uh, but it's then is the expectation is you're going into the chorus. You can change one line in that chorus going out. And as long as you keep the integrity of the rhyme scheme around it, but just change a rhyme each time, uh, if you, especially if you're uh, repeating the chorus over and over and over again, change one line, either the second or third line. Um, talk about the song Girl Crush, written by women mm -hmm. for women. Yeah. Um, Grammy and country, or Grammy country yep. song of the year. Uh, yeah. What are your thoughts on that? Well, it uses the, the title immediately. <clears throat> I've got a girl crush. Um, but it did not go to number one on the airplay charts at all. Hmm. So it was not a darling of radio. Uh, it was it was more, more of sales, um, and it was... Uh, a different audience that bought that structure. And it was basically verse, pre-chorus, chorus, verse, pre-chorus, chorus, a small vestigial bridge, uh, chorus and out. That was the structure on that. And it was fourth form, which uh, I've noticed that there are a lot of fourth <clears throat> verse, pre-chorus, chorus, because the expectation is that that exists in pop Whenever you're writing a pop song, the expectation of the listener is there's going to be verse, pre-chorus, chorus, verse, pre-chorus, chorus, small vestigial bridge, and chorus and out. Um, so not so much for country, but suddenly when country is taking into account streaming and sales and airplay as well, uh, that, that structure is becoming more and more valid. Uh, Jesse Peck wants to know, Ralph, uh, speaking guitar work, uh, is the more rock form such as Keith Urban going to stay along with the strong beats? Question doesn't really make sense the way it's worded, Jesse. But I think what he's saying, um, will the rockier form of country stick around but have strong beats with it? 
Well, they, they, they really don't exceed um, um, 100 beats per minute. Uh, there were only, uh, I think there were only three uh, of the 38 number one songs that w went over 100 beats per minute. Uh, whether you can have them, I'm, I'm, I would have to look at, at my notes and see exactly what uh, that the beats per minute on, on the uh, Keith Urban song are, but I would guarantee you they're probably about 85 to 90. Okay. Um, I'm sorry, I'm scanning the list because there, there's a lot of chit chat going on between the questions. Uh, question, Ralph, do you have another book in the works? Basically, the, the book actually answers all the questions that you, you need. I can use uh, current illustrations of those particular works, but if you know, if you, you, you're aware, I use probably the, the last Im, ir, ir, illustrations I used were two years old. Um, I will probably do another one the end of this year, but it's going to be the, exactly the same structure. Um, when you uh, uh, when you behave outside that and it becomes aberrant behavior, then that's basic. Basically, uh, you you have the knowledge of it, so therefore you uh, can grow from that. That's why you take chances and you you grow proportionately because you have the basic knowledge of the of the, the chords okay um i'm gonna get the next song ready to go while you answer this question mm -hmm. uh do you see the rondo song form coming back in country i would love the rondo structure coming back um it it kind of it was in passenger let her go it was that structure kind of um there is a, a guy in Ireland who has just recorded um, uh, a, a song that was a hit, oh gosh, about 20 years ago. Um, but it is a lovely form. First of all, it starts with the chorus, goes to the, the first verse, goes back to the chorus, then a small uh, instrumental, then the middle eight or bridge, then resolving chorus. There is no second verse in perfect rondo form. Uh, um, it was Good Morning Beautiful, which was a lovely, lovely song, um, was written in perfect rondo structure. Uh, and it's R-O-N-D-O, uh, was originally, uh, originally was uh, from the R-O-N-D-E-A-U, symphonic. Uh, and I was reading a book uh, uh, by uh, um, W.O. Smith, uh, which was set in, in the 30s and in Chicago, and he was talking about Rondo, R-O-N-D-O, and because it started with the chorus, it got everyone up to dance. Well, basically what they, they use in uh, Europe is they will use the chorus to get everybody up on the floor. So uh, I think it is really, really valid, and I would love to see someone do something with dance in Rondo, perfect Rondo structure. Okay, let's listen to another song which is called Wishing For You. Here we go. Okay. I sit and walk setting sun waiting for the time you come knowing all the while you're not with me I savor all the alcohol I often wish to share it all knowing all the while you're not with me And all I ever wanted was your love 
from just a few short hours Instead I'm dreaming days away Keeping all my fears at bay By wishing for you Sometimes I gaze a glowing moon It floats across the starlit sky Knowing all the while you're not with me I listen to the daffodils Soaking up the rays that spill Knowing all the while Instead I'm dreaming days away Keeping all my fears at bay By wishing for Okay, there's there are several things. Um, while you're not with me, wishing for you, what happened? That's the the, the immediate question is: this person is pining and uh, and drinking and gazing at the glowing moon and floating, and that she's not with me. Why? Why? What? What's the deal? Uh, because that would drive me crazy. Um, I want to know. And the other thing is, you create an expectation knowing all the while you're not with me. Uh, knowing all the while you're not with me. Knowing all the while you're not with, with me. Knowing all the while you're not with me. That really should be the title. Um, I, I, I sit and watch the setting sun, watching for the time you'll come, knowing all the time you're not with me. I savor all the alcohol, wish, often wish to share it all, knowing all the while you're not with me. All I ever wanted was your love for just a few, few short hours. Instead, I'm dreaming days away, keeping all my fears at bay, and all the while you're not with me. Sometimes, and then in the second verse, I would not want to know what happened. I mean, did he drive her away, or he just was too cowardly, or... And something that makes this guy look like a good... Maybe kill her off. You know, hey, death happens. Uh, maybe maybe she just died with any luck at all. Um, <laughs> But what you what you can do, by the way, and, and you can extend, extend it, and you can do verse, verse, chorus, and then maybe just have her die in that second verse, but listen to, break it up and get rid of 
uh, the uh, the second part of the uh, the second verse, um, go to that chorus, and then you could the the do the bridge. Um, but you you need to explain to me why she is not there. It's the the big. You've got the great beginning. Now I need to to go to what what's happened. What's your term for that? Assumptive writer's assumption. Writer's assumption. And see, that's the kind of thing I battle all the time because I'll play it for someone and say, well, "What are you talking about?" And all of a sudden, I realize at the moment I have to explain it to someone. I have failed in my job, and my job was to give it a, a beginning, a middle, and an end, totally, uh, a, of, of that whole story, mm -hmm. whole cloth. Uh, I've got to. If I don't do that, I fail. We get screeners that make comments in the feedback that goes back to members talking about this very thing on a fairly regular basis. And the members get very frustrated when they see it in writing. What do you mean you didn't understand who she was or where she went or where she came from? All of a sudden, she walked into the room. Who is she? Why did she walk in the room? What relevance does she have to the story? And yeah. it really upsets the members. But it's because they've got writer's assumption. Mm -hmm. They know the story that, yeah. that is the germ yeah. that, that hatched the storyline for the song. And yeah. it, you know, I, the, the, that, that is one of the biggest battles all professional writers have, is writer's assumption. You assume that the listener knows everything you know. They don't. And your job is to invest them with that story. Maybe it's a, a good idea to block out the story. Um, you know, write down an outline. You know, boy, boy is lonely. Boy meets girl. Boy and girl fall in love. Boy yeah. and girl move in together. Boy and girl have a fight, you know, and, and block out a storyline so you've got sure. the beginning, middle, and end in front of you, and then write to that. A, a song that is basically a mini script. It is a, a, a three minute or four minute, minute long script for a movie mm -hmm. that has a beginning, a middle, and an end. Uh, you can expand it, and, uh, like the gambler uh, expanded from that little four-minute song uh, into a movie that has fed uh, Don, Don Schlitz really well for a long, long time. <laughs> so, hey. All right, let's do one more song. Um, this one, I'm, I hope I'm pronouncing this right. It's either Jan Bars or Jan Bars. I'm not sure. Oh, normally we don't give out the names. Sorry about that. I messed up. <laughs> um, and it's called Make a Move.
Perfectly designed for uh, radio, whatever, uh, whatever form you want it in, streaming, whatever. Uh, it's under 100 beats per minute. Uh, so you walk up and in the club. Um, it also gets to the first use of title, make a move within 60 seconds. It also uses the um, uh, oh 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 oh, which is call and response. Uh, which is really, really good. Most people don't sing very well. Um, therefore, whenever you na 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 na, hey hey hey, or yay yay, so they can ayo join, ayo ayo yeah, so they can join in with the, the, that song and they can sing along with it. The moment they sing along with it, you own them. They will they will love that song forever simply because. Uh, also, the woman is empowered. She's she is dance till we own the night. Your body burning into mine. Oh, you won my heart. She she is in control, uh, totally all the way through. I know how this ends. Boy, you won't regret it. Baby's got moves of baby got moves of my own that I'm gonna make. And she is a, a strong woman. And uh, dead ends and. If everything's right on. It's it's leading leading me through the uh, song by changing rooms. Uh, feelings I just can't ignore, got me wanting more and more. I think we know this could, could lead. I can give you what you need. Uh, it, it leads me properly through the song. It's well written. Good stuff. Yay. Let's talk about writing your targets and casting songs. Um, a lot of people finish songs, and if you ask them, who would you pitch this to? Hmm. They couldn't tell you. Um, whereas most pro songwriters that I know, they don't necessarily, sometimes, but they don't always sit down to write for a target. But when they finish a song, they can usually tell you who some potential targets are. Yeah. How important is it to write with targets in mind or song, you know, where you would pitch it? It's, it's very, very important, first of all, because for you as a creative human being, uh, assembling product and knowing what you're going to do, in 50% in of the time, 70% of the time, it will end up being recorded by someone that you never thought would, would ever record it. Um, uh, I had a hit like four years ago, five years ago, uh, with Cliff Richard in, uh, in England, number two record. Um, but that I wrote with Paul Brady, and it, I never in a million years would I would I have thought of Cliff Richard. It's like, huh, what? It just didn't occur to me at mm -hmm. all. Um, there are so many uh, songs that I write with other people that I'm sure and convinced that so and so will record and somebody the polar opposite records it so write your best song uh, resist writer's uh, assumption uh, set the the uh, listener up 
invite them into that song, minutia and detail in the first four lines lead me to that first use of chorus in 60 seconds. Like if you're if you're popping, uh, doing pop stuff, uh, add a call and response. It's really really important. Um, it's 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 make the, that song a script that somebody is going to want to spend one million dollars on. That is the key because it is going to require that amount of money spent on it. And if it's not worth a million dollars to you, then it probably won't be worth a million dollars to whomever has the resources. I have said to people in the past, mostly in the early days of Taxi, uh, when I would answer a lot of the phones, people would say, I I've got a hit song. All I need is that one person to hear my hit and get behind me. And I'd say, well, if you're that certain about your song, then ask your parents or your family members or friends or other relatives to go take out second mortgages on their houses and, and back you. And if nobody raises their hand and says, I'll do it, then maybe yeah. the song needs a little retooling. Yeah. You know, that's, if you sure. got a hit, people can hear it and would yeah. go, I want to, you know, invest in that. Um, this was a good question that went by a couple minutes ago. How do you balance the heart? That's heart, not art. The heart and the science as a songwriter. Well, there are certain songs that you write for yourself. Um, you, they are personal to you, and you just loved it. And they, they, it fulfilled everything that you needed to express at that point in time. Maybe a year, two years, three years down the road, you'll get look at that idea and suddenly want to make it commercial and uh you can you can change it at that point in time but you've got to it's it's cathartic in nature you are monumentally dysfunctional mm -hmm. as a human being that's the the basic profile for a great writer so go ahead and be monumentally dysfunctional but don't expect <laughs> expect those uh cathartic gems cough phlegms <laughs> that you cough up to get the same respect as the the songs, the ditties uh, that you 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 craft and you tailor for that are going to be scripts for someone to spend a million dollars on. Um, somebody said million dollars. Uh, to whom does a million dollars go? I think you might have missed the early part of the show where we talked about this, which is that's what a record label is going to invest in marketing, promotion, um, all, all that stuff that record companies do runs about a million dollars for a song. Yeah, um, a, an agreement involving emergent, this is the International Federation of Pho Phonographic Industry, uh, which is a UK-based uh, trade organization. Uh, an agreement which the uh, half a million dollars to two million dollars is an agreement in, involving emerging artists and involves the payment of an advance, the funding of a recording, the music, uh, video production, tour support, and promotional costs. It can cost between half a million dollars and U.S. two million dollars to break an artist in a major recorded music artist. Market. Market. That those does the facts. All right, a couple more questions. We've got a little bit of time left. Miguel says, thank you very much, so much for your answer and your wisdom and being here. Um, I'm supposed to be here. <laughs> and we get to golf tomorrow. Um, can I tell him who we're golfing with tomorrow? Sure. <laughs> okay. He hesitated. <laughs> All right. Um, what's the gentleman's name? I'm drawing a blank from uh, Imro. Victor Finn. Victor Finn, who is the head of Imro, which is like the ASCAP or BMI of Ireland. Um, and I've golfed with him before. He's a great golfer. Yes. I suck. Ralph is somewhere in the middle. <laughs> Ralph, Ralph is the glue that holds Victor and I together. And we're also being joined tomorrow by Paul Williams, um, who is the chairman of ASCAP. So, uh, and from what I understand, uh, Paul and I are probably on a pretty similar level as golfers, so we may want to ride in a cart together. Well, uh, you, you're going to have a very good time, young man. <laughs> I can't wait. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, 
a question. Uh, do you think a co-write has a better chance of hitting the mark uh, over just one individual? So a solo write versus a co-write. Do you find the co-writing improves the odds of making a better song and therefore having a hit? Well, generally one person will initiate the, the co-write. Uh, one person will be so totally dissatisfied with it and go, this isn't working for me. <clears throat> and will initiate and take the, the hold and take the reins and probably carry out 90% of that co-write. So it's always an individual process and uh, you, you, you rely on, like I rely on, on people for melodic structures. Um, they will lead me somewhere that I would not have gone. And it's very exciting for me. I, I really, really love it. I, I would. It, it helps if they're uh, strong contributors uh, melodically as well, because I've written melody and lyrics to, to what, whatever, a uh, load of hits. So um, just having fun. Have the more fun you have, the more money you make. Yes, we. <laughs> um, what kind of golf clubs do you use? Um, Callaways for me, Ralph. Uh, Callaways. There you go. Yeah. Um, okay. I always have a good golfer with a fair golfer to speed the play, Michael. Yeah. Well, it was so windy today. Seriously, the course that we that we usually play at together. It's it's a big boy course. It's a very long course. It's out in the mountains and. The rattlesnakes and uh, you guys actually, you and uh, Hookman heard a rattler today, right? Yeah. I, I was getting yes. ready to swing and you guys are going, there's a rattler over there, but we didn't see it, yeah. but they heard it. Yeah. Um, anyway, a lot, lot of uh, a million places to lose balls. And I got to tell you, every time you lose one in knee high anything, you think twice every time you put your foot down yeah. out there. Yeah. Um, Yes, to expand on that, how many single writer songs? Oh, okay, that's a good question. How many single writer songs are you seeing in your study uh, versus co-writes? Uh, any uh, evidence on that? Almost none. Almost none. As a matter of fact... Every, Almost every, everything's a co-write? Yeah. Um, ever since uh, Taylor Swift stopped writing, uh, started... Uh, writing with Max Martin and Red One and White Shadow and whatever. Um, although I would imagine that uh, they she forms probably ninety percent of that that song. And they, I would I would just suggest yeah. that their contribution is production skills and uh, maybe uh, call and response and uh, I I don't know because I'm not there in the room with them. But uh, you mm -hmm. know. Brings up a great point. Um, mm -hmm. I think it was Russell Landwehr, one of our members who's actually in the chat today, uh, was chiding the other taxi members that they don't take advantage of taxis for them uh, frequently enough. And it is such a great place to meet people with skill sets that complement yours. There are a lot of people out there that have great ideas for songs and a great melody and a great basic mm -hmm. idea, but they sound somewhat dated. Um, they don't have current production shops. Then there are people who have more technical skills, listen to a lot of current pop radio, and have those production shops, but yet they aren't great song crafters. So I would <clears throat> say, based on Ralph's knowledge that virtually everything is a co-write these days, that you guys should spend more time in the yes. forum and meeting each other. And, Definitely and you know, do. raise your hand and say, this is what I do well, this is what I'm looking for. Find your collaborators. I, I go out uh, into the uh, workplace, from my workplace, which is clubs and um, in conferences. And I, I, I was just at the East Coast Music Awards in uh, Sydney, Nova Scotia. And I was there and I, I ran into 12 writers and there, there are probably a couple that I really, I think resonate with me uh, that I could really work well with. Uh, I'm going uh, to the ASCAP Expo. I'm doing a Murphy's Law on uh, Saturday uh, for an hour and a half, uh, basically. And I will probably meet two or three people 
who really resonate with me, that I feel comfortable with, that I could sit in a room for two or three days and write with. Um, then I would go on to Canada, to excuse me, to Toronto, to Canadian Music Week, where I will maybe run into one or two uh, out of a thousand people, people that resonate with me, that make me feel good, that make me want to write a song with them. Uh, Tony Anderson wants to know, what instruments do you play, Ralph? I play guitar and piano badly. Um, I really appreciate piano and I, I love it. And a matter of fact, I've written a couple of number ones with um, Bobby Wood, who is a great keyboard player from Memphis. And uh, Don't Take Me Half the Way and He Got You. I wrote two number ones with him. But I, I love keyboard players. Uh, I think they're wonderful. And matter of fact, if, if they have Pro Tools or Logic uh, that adds in, into that, uh, that is really, really cool. All right. Uh, no more questions on the screen right now. So, and we're five minutes over. So let's call it a day. Um, one more question. I saw, I saw Gloria posted this earlier and I didn't get to it. Uh, does the 100 BPM or less rule apply to pop music? Well, it, if, if you look at uh, um, Wrecking Ball, uh, if you look at some of the bigger songs, they're under 100 beats per minute because they're, they're uh, received at radio, very well received at radio. And radio is a sedentary, it's, when, you, when you're in your car or in your office, you are seated. You are not dancing. Um, I, I had a dance label in New York back in, in, in the 70s, um, Hardcore Records. And uh, we, we had a lot of dance records. Everyone was doing cocaine at the time. So the heart rate was elevated. It was about 100 and, 135 beats per minute. Um, but so I, I, I know all about the BPMs and, and I, I love dance records, but when I'm out dancing, so. <laughs> yeah, I've never, as long, I've known Ralph for like 25 years. I've never seen him dance and I'm grateful for that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> all right. Uh, that's it, guys. Yes, Ralph will be at the Road Rally, which is November yes. 3rd through the 6th this year. Um, it's going to be an awesome rally. I am trying so hard. There's somebody that I know you guys will love that I'm trying to get to keynote the rally this year. And uh, I don't know what my chances are, but it never, you know, never hurts to try. So just know I'm already working on the road rally to make it the best ever because it will be the 20th road rally. Oh. 20 of those suckers. And every year, I, after it's done, I say, I am never, ever doing another one of those. <laughs> ever. So 20th Road Rally, November 3rd through thank, November 7th. Thank God you do. Yeah, well. Thank God you do, man. <laughs> thank God for my family being patient enough to let me work the crazy hours. And uh, yeah. now my wife is involved, so it makes it a little easier. It's pretty ironic. My wife is here working today. Um, and Ralph and I were out playing golf. That's the first time in the 24-year history of the company that that ever happened. So thanks, Deb. I think and, it's great. <laughs> <laughs> and thanks, Ralph, Deb. Ralph and I will be back out on the course tomorrow. And Yay. Ralph, thank you for doing the show. That's and, wonderful. Uh, for and being perky, you. because I'll tell you, the two of us dragged our butts into the office today after that round of golf. The sun and the wind really takes it out of you. So we will see you guys next week. And I think for next week's show, I have slotted that we're going to listen to forwards and returns from the $30,000 commercial listing that we ran a little while ago. So I will see you guys then. Thank you once again, Ralph. And thank you, audience, for watching another exciting episode of Tech.